Welcome to the fraternity. The organization is ancient. It's a guild of assassins. They have particular talents that go far beyond the ordinary, which leads us to Wesley. Wesley's father was one of us. So we know that if we need to replace one, we have to go through their bloodline. Wanted is about a young guy who is kind of drifting through life. He's got no respect from anybody in his life. He accepts the world the way it is and the way he's told it is. And he is told that he is nothing. He is plucked from that world, literally plucked in an instant, and told that not only is he not a loser, but to the contrary, he's the son of one of the greatest assassins who ever lived. And it is the belief of the fraternity that he possesses both genetically and innately the same skill set that his father, this great assassin, possessed. If they have the bloodline, they can be made competent, but in his case, it took a little doing. <laughs> Shoot the wings off the flies. I really think you had me mixed up with somebody else. One, three, three. His father is murdered by another member of this organization who has gone rogue and who started to operate for himself and for his own games. And this guy who's killed my father is the best. Nobody can go up against them. And that's the beginning of the movie. Father died yesterday on the rooftop of the Metropolitan Building. The man who killed him is behind you. Oh! It was very difficult to find, to find a person who will play this hero of the movie because we were trying to find a man who people will identify themselves in him and he looks like everybody and at the same time he has something inside which tells us that he's different. By very nature of the fact that they're casting someone like me in an action movie I'm not used to seeing someone like myself in those roles and as a movie lover I complain frequently that I'm fed up of seeing six foot five alpha male in these roles. So when the part comes my way, I really didn't have anywhere to hide or to take it. So many people will be able to relate to him and actually feel like, well, if that was me, and I was working in my little cubicle and my life sucked and I didn't have excitement and I didn't have skills or I didn't know what I was worth, could this realistically be my fantasy of what could happen to my life? So James really represents the everyman and I think that that is very cool to see. I think the casting's inspired. That's the thing that really excited me about it because um, they were unusual choices. Like James in particular captures that everyman thing. But he's got that look of madness in his eyes as well, which is just perfect. He has a very unique sense of humor and he's very ironic and he's very skeptical. And if he believes, then audience will believe in it. Because it was very important for the story to create the arc of the character. He has to start as an ordinary, weak person and to finish as a superman. It's a big challenge, big change in the character. Quite a difficult uh, change as well. It's something to see him go from being like just the average, everyday guy to really becoming one of the greatest assassins ever. He's uh, incredible. James is a really gutsy actor and, and to take it from the nebbish kind of office worker that he is at the start of this movie into the killing machine he is by the third act. You know, I don't know anyone else that could have pulled that off as well. The part that James is playing is the kind of part that I always wanted when I was in my 20s. There's a wonderful trajectory for a young actor to start and be absolutely convincing is one thing and then to metamorphose into something that's equally convincing but rather brilliant. I'm jealous. I like these actors who just go from zero to hundred, you know. It's like he snaps like from one state to the other and uh, effortless. And when you watch him, there is no wrong take. It's not been the most demanding movie I've worked on, but it's been the most physically demanding. I suppose uh, starting at the top, I had to jump through a window that didn't exist.
then I had to put a gun through the eye socket of a dummy that looked very much like Mark Warren and, uh, and shoot through his head. Then I had to run with said dummy over a course of, I don't know, some 900 metres, if you count every take, which looked ridiculous and uh, felt ridiculous and was very awkward. Then I was dragged along the ground, very much cowboy attached to a runaway horse, and I was dragged a distance of 10 metres, repeatedly, uh, quickly. And then, while being dragged, launch my foot off a dead person and fly into the air. Then I had to jump off a trampoline 15 times to try and catch a lampshade. Until we realised that it was better if I just jumped off a box of wood. One take we did at the box of wood, and that's what's going to be in the film. I think that was better. I think that's everything. I got to do that thing that me liked us all, kind of secretly go, God, it'd be great to do a job where you get to train and all that. Otherwise, fitness-wise, I would never find myself in a gym. I would rather eat dog poo than find myself in a gym. It's all yours. So we teach him to get used to pain and to learn how to be prepared. <laughs> There are two limiters to human performance. One is lack of preparation, and the other is fear of pain. So they kick seven colours of crap out of me every day. All the stunt people keep saying he's stunt man quality when it comes to taking a punch and throwing himself onto the floor. She is like my conditioner, my, my drill sergeant. And yeah, she kicks my ass a lot. She kicks it and kicks it and kicks it again, and then when it's I had five minutes to rest, she kicks it again. There's one scene where, where I beat him up, yeah. Why are you here? I don't know why I'm here. If anybody has any sort of fantasies about being beaten up by Angelina Jolie, watch this film and you will have them all satisfied. What did you say? Boxes is, is like a master at what she does, and she's a great teacher, so. She's schooling Wesley all the way through. I'd just done a very, very serious film and had a baby and <laughs> wanted to get back in shape a bit and do something not so serious. And I'm used to action movies where I, it's relying on my physical ability. It's always fun to do this kind of jumping around, punching people, things. She's perfect for this. She's very grounded. She's very specific what her character has to do in every second, in every situation. She knows exactly how she wants to be in, in the movie. That was the most interesting call, you know, because uh, I had no idea she was being cast whatsoever. And that was amazing, you know, because there's probably no female star in the world right now bigger than she is. I have a feeling she's going to fall in love with me when she meets me. I think it's going to be quite hard for her to, uh, to resist, uh, you know, a Scotsman. Crazy. For the character of Fox, I think all of us had in our minds Angelina Jolie. I think there were a few women actresses who have the physical strength and skill to believe that she can be one of the great assassins that exists in our world and at the same time has the emotional strength, uh, the no-nonsense attitude, the commitment that this particular character has to a particular code that's unwavering and is utter and complete. The reason I liked my character is she believes in this code. Kill one, save a thousand. She's probably the fraternity's most stern advocate of the code of the fraternity. She follows it probably more strictly than anybody else because she has seen firsthand how it has affected her life and how it can screw the world up if you don't follow the code. She was a regular person going to law school and lost her family and was brought into the group and is an assassin. She's like my right hand. She is the training overseer. Wesley is the only one who can get to him. Get back to work. The fraternity is run by an actor called Morgan Freeman. Ladies and gentlemen, Morgan Freeman. I'm sure they're going to show you some pictures now. Morgan Freeman, 
fortunately is here to save all of us because for all the things that are far too like cool action movie, he somehow explains them in the movie and you believe everything that comes out of that man's mouth. For an action movie, it seems to have the most kind of A-list cast. You know, Freeman's one of those guys who just brings a bit of dignity to anything he does. I found that he's very good because he's very grounded and at the same time he's very uh, noble and his combination works perfect. Sloan is another one of those with that peculiar ability and he is a bit beyond the ordinary because he's like the chosen one, he's the leader. Find a connection in this room. Maybe the only way of finding out who you are. We needed a character who was both a father figure who had a paternal instinct but could also articulate the mythology of the piece. So having him lead you through the world that is the fraternity felt like one of those perfect marriages of actor to role. Sloan has over many years maintained this alpha position because his mental acuity is so well developed. He needs Wesley, so he becomes so almost a father figure to explain to him why he has to go through what he has to go through in order to become who he must become. It is your long-awaited destiny to join us. The other main assassin figures are the butcher, the repairman, the gunsmith. We have uh, common rap artist. And once I play the gunsmith, who is really a master at, at weaponry, guns specifically. For the gunsmith, it's definitely an art form, you know. These guns are part of his expression. You need to know what it's like to put a bullet in a body. She might be somebody's mom! Yeah. Common is kind of the loveliest man I think I've ever met in my life. I may be going too far, but I might not. Repairman, five minutes. I am playing the repairman, who basically has the role of training Wesley into dealing with pain. What do you repair? A lifetime of bad habits. And he does that by inflicting lots of pain on him. By distributing pain, he's getting you numb to it and taking away some of the pain that you've already been through, you know, and getting that out of your system. I don't necessarily see this part as bad, all good. He just has a job to do, and his job is just to train James in dealing with pain. Some of the other cats on the team um, as part of the fraternity is, is the butcher. To spend a lot of time with knives? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah! It was a rhetorical question. I got here like uh, two weeks before an actual shooting. We didn't have much time to train. Two weeks. They taught me how to fight, how to use the weapons. But most importantly, they taught me how to fight in here. You know, for some people, it, it looked terrifying, the scenes that I did with James. But coming out from my character, the butcher, I had a lot of fun. And maybe that's why they thought this scene was terrifying. But I had a lot of fun with them. An exterminator. Um... You know, even though he's carrying around rats and he's very good with explosives, he also flushes out different things that you, you know, may need to get out of your body. Hi. How are you doing? That the exterminator is a bit of an outsider in the, in the fraternity. He looks quite uh, harmless, but people are afraid of him. Uh, it is clear that he realizes that not everything is right. They fucked you up, didn't they? What the hell did they do to you? Guild works through Sloan, but Sloan gets his orders from the loom of fate. And that loom has a code in it. Fate designates that someone should be killed in order for the world to carry on in its balanced way. And these guys are the guys who execute those orders. This idea that if you could know who is going to kill someone tomorrow, if you knew who the Hitler was, if you can get to them and if you could, if you could assassinate them, would you save thousands of lives? Our fraternity is there to really more than anything to create the balance 
in the world. We are people who have been blessed with certain gifts and talents, but we balance out the world with our talents by going out and doing the will of the loom of fate. Sloan possesses an enormous energy which forces people to obey. Morgan Freeman, perfect. Sloan, for me, we believe him. It was a diff very difficult goal for this character because he's lying. You want me to kill Robert Dean Darden? Not me. Fate. Sloan starts mixing up things and working for his own reasons, playing basically God. And Cross figures this all out, so he uh, left the fraternity. And Sloan makes everybody hunt Cross now. They train me to go after Cross, and that becomes the focal point for a large part of the film. <laughs> playing Cross, he's supposed to be the best assassin ever lived. He's hunted almost doing the whole film. He appears as the bad guy, and in the end, it turns out he was the good guy. You're my son. For Cross, in our case, it's pretty simple. He tries to keep his son from harm. That means getting his son out of their hands. It's a very uh, new thing for me, a new experience. Uh, I never did action films, really. It's fun, it's all about appearing cool being precise, being confident. It's just an interesting character. I always love to work as an actor with as less dialogue as possible. I think everything I can show without, uh, without explaining. And uh, so in this film, I don't talk at all. It's great, it's, uh, but it's also very stylish and it's something I I've never done. You can have a different life, Wesley. Like your father wanted for you. I was always interested in doing sort of a film version of comics. As well, well uh, you know, the thing is, I think he's, he's kind of a bit of an enigma. You're introduced to him, he's one thing, and then the plot is very sort of convoluted, and when he resurfaces, he's a completely different character. He is uh, responsible for manufacturing a very unusual cartridge that's a kind of porcelain bullet, in fact and is very familiar with and has access to this magical loom that foretells people's destinies. It makes you think like about fate or, you know, what's your hand in fate and what it is about connecting with, with where you come from. I believe that people are born with certain abilities and certain thoughts to, to be or do something and are naturally kind of drawn to something. Um, I suppose you could call that fate. And in a way, I find it interesting because what Wesley is running away from in the world is, you know, it's an action movie, but he's running away from something that I think we can all identify with, being told what to do. It essentially is a, it's about finding yourself and really connecting with who you are. We're here to enlighten him about who he is so that he can reach his best potential and be great, be what he was created to be. <laughs> We've gone and gotten a fantastic group of actors who have tremendous skill and craft and put them in what might otherwise be just a simple genre movie, and I think all with the idea of sort of bending the genre. It was amazing the gravitas that that suddenly had when it was Angelina James and Morgan Freeman delivering those lines. It feels as if you're seeing something pretty special. All the artists that come from different places and different um, walks of life and different regions, it's a great experience, and it gave the piece of work a broadness. Of course it is very exciting to be a part of this team, to work with these kinds of actors and these producers. I'm still like, calling home like, man, I'm in a movie with Morgan Freeman, Angelina Jolie, James McAvoy. Actually it feels quite weighty and as if there's real characters and real issues being developed, and amongst the most fantastic action set pieces. James is very funny, so hopefully it's not the uh, we take ourselves too seriously action movie, it's kind of... It's fun. I think that's pretty old train. Still is. I think probably the, my most favourite stunt was jumping over the bridge on the L train on a wire, which I did completely myself. This bridge is leaving the station. Running up top of the train we're doing today, we 
typical of this film, we don't have a train that's moving, but we have a bridge that moves at 20 miles an hour. And we're shooting a sequence where Fox and Wes are running along that train and jumping over the bridge and under the bridge. And to give you an example of Timor, originally Wes jumped over the bridge, smashed through the gates and jumped back on the train. And this morning he decided he wanted him to do a handspring and then a front somersault over the bridge. With the real speed of the train, I believe that if he will jump, he can do one, he will do one touch of the ground in the middle of this tunnel and then he will land. Yeah. Hopefully the boys have got that sorted by the time I get back. I don't see it. For me, oh, okay. it has to be two touches. He has to yeah. touch here and touch there. Yeah. You'll see. Watch when it stops. It works. Uh, the only question is, can he be, can we have him pull him in the game? We need this moment, otherwise he's waiting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I did all my own stones. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you watch all these scenes and you're like, you didn't, I didn't do that. Just jump and wait. Wait for the impact. In the same position like this. Do it keep running. Just Jumping over the bridge, I did all myself, and it was cool. Through the wood, and then land on the thing. In this evolution of visual effects, in Wanted, what Timor has done is a way of looking at something uniquely. Visual effects is a term we're using for CG effects, but for audience it's a story and exciting show. And visual effects helps us to, to achieve it. I think the use of the visual effects is unusual in the sense is that it plays with reality in a way that I certainly haven't seen it before. In the film, there's probably about 800 effect shots. We've taken it on to do all our preparation through a main central hub, which is all controlled by Timur and his company in Moscow. This, I think, was mostly unusual, and then for the first time, I think, for a Hollywood film to actually have a lot of it done in Russia. We're using all the resources. It's a great CG artist helps to do this. Timur, is a художник. Timur's main gift is that he is an artist, first of all, and his artistic approach to sequences starts from the art design, so he sees those sequences as an artist, first of all. English is not his language, but visual imagery is, and as we went through the process of working on the sequences, Timur would go away in his you know, science lab and come back with these sequences about how he wanted to shoot something. Timur pre-visualizes on the computer. It's how he uses math and science to create images that will feel like they are of our world, even though you've never seen them before. Timur, he explained to artist uh, what he wants to do, and the artist will make the previous. It's great in that you see what he's going for, because he'll previous something very specifically, but at the same time isn't so hung up in the camera has to be right here and they have to do exactly what I did in CG. He'll previous a whole scene to explore the scene and to communicate and start a dialogue with everybody. Yeah! Previsualization helps to start to communicate between different departments, between CG department and stand people and before the shooting they, they're thinking simultaneously and moving forward together. That's like the stuff when the train ends up crumpled in this ravine. That was in a pre-visualization eight months ago. The Pandolini sequence, that was definitely very difficult because of the complication of creating that train and the environment of the gorge and all of that entirely in CG. There was some plate shot on location, but the shots were so specific to the, the camera work that we couldn't really use them. For example, this shot here, 
we have no more plate left. So every other background is done CG. The big challenge there, of course, was to overcome the feeling of miniature and, and, and to get the proper feeling of scale. It was always very important for Timur to make it look real. <laughs> Timor really did know what he wanted. He loves the real lighting, he loves the real feel, he loves the real exposure to everything. Traditionally speaking, when you see a visual effect shot, you know it's a visual effect shot because of the way it's exposed. A lot of directors, in some cases, like the sky perfectly exposed next to the interiors, and that's really impossible, you know, nothing looks like that. The only way that you can see that sort of dynamic range is through your eye. When you capture something on a film camera, you see the sky blown out or the interior underexposed or something like that. The great thing with working with Timor is that he wanted that real look. Blow out the sky, you know, let it go into a silhouette and stuff like that. So it was a bit of a challenge because, you know, it goes against traditionally what we've been doing in the past. But one of the signature effects that he does go for is that he'll go for a slow-mo shot and then very speed it or speed it back up as well. I never worked on a film where so much of the photography was altered in terms of what speed it was run at. So that was a big challenge. We were originally looking at this down in LA with him. We were going, oh, you know, I don't know if this is going to work. It's just, trust me, trust me, it will work. It's really funny because at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, Timor is right. It really works. The sequence flows together and it tells a wonderful story and it's a fun story and it's a cool story. You could conceivably say that you could train rats or work with real rats, and I think there were, in some of the shots there were actually some real rats there, but in general for that whole idea of the rats having you know, the bombs strapped to them, digital was obviously a good choice for that. The big one where the dump truck empties them out, the animation has to be cloned between the different rats, so they had to create motion cycles and all those things. And, and in some way, you know, that's the easy part, doing a close-up rat, some of the close-up shots, you know, where it's a lot more character animation, detailed animation every second, you look at every movement and this and that, it's, it can almost be more challenging because so your eye is really focused on those. Again, there are some really interesting speed up and slow down moments, and especially, you know, the one that the rat is thrown towards camera and has got the little timer on it and the time runs down, and it kind of freezes that whole moment right before it explodes. Timor gives us these moments where the details are really larger than life and beautiful when Wes learns to curve bullets. Very small things become very large and will be with a bullet when it travels around the corner doing these impossible things. And again, a lot of study of physics and aerodynamics and movement of bullets went into all of those elements to create visual effect that would feel completely possible and completely within the grasp of reality. Those shots, we really went heavy on the defocusing elements because realistically, the bullet coming towards camera, of course the background would have to be extremely out of focus with that kind of close-up photography to kind of keep that reality. I think one thing about this movie is it really runs to the concept of fantasy and tries to make it physically believable. If you don't use CG correctly, they can become apparent rather than seamless. The trick is, the art is to know when to be out of it and when to be in it. I think the main thing is that Timur doesn't get carried away with special effects and visual effects, but he uses them when they're needed in the film. He tends to judge every effect by, is it telling an emotional story or not? When you have emotional context, then visual effects works. And every time when you have something non-emotionally connected with the rest of the materials, then it's very dangerous because visual effects stops storytelling. If it doesn't tell an emotional story with it, he won't do it. I think that's the reason why the visual effects are certainly of great effect in the film. But at the end, the viewer is going to completely absorb this kind of moment in an emotional way. It is a vision that has emerged from Timor's mind, but pulling from a great pool of resources of tremendously talented individuals that he has here. And I think what we're seeing is the amalgam of that great collaboration and creating visual effects that haven't been seen before.
Some Wanted is based on a independent limited edition comic series created by Mark Millar, who's a very well-known creator of comics. And his comic book, Want It, in its limited series, became one of the most successful, if not the most successful, independent comic in the last several years on the marketplace. It's distinctive in its tone, and we've worked very hard to maintain the distinctive qualities and the integrity of the source material in his comics. So I wait for You mean with the trigger? Yeah, with the trigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I read the script, I found that the idea is great, the story is great, character has an interesting journey, but something that was unclear with the tone. And then I read the original comic book and I understood that it will be really interesting for me to execute this story because of the tone and characters of the original comic book. It's brave, it's entertaining and edgy. As a kid, I was the youngest of six children, and uh, I think, you know, because back then there wasn't really much good on TV, my older brothers used to kind of make stuff up for me, you know, and just out of pure boredom. And one of the things they told me was that superheroes used to really exist, and like most kids, uh, you know, believe in Santa until the age of seven or eight, I believed in Superman. I thought this was just part of history, and uh, suddenly I just began to gradually realise it probably wasn't true. But as a little kid, I also found a photograph of George Reeves dressed in a Superman costume. There was no TV show back then, we didn't get reruns back in school of the old 1950s show. So to, to me, this was evidence, there he is, there's a photograph of the, the real guy, you know? This isn't a movie, there he is, you know? And one of the things my brothers told me is the superheroes were all here one day, and uh, the villains teamed up and beat them, and, uh, and they all disappeared and made everyone forget about them. And uh, maybe when I grew up, I could be one of the superheroes, you know, and like uh, bring them all back. Uh, I was maybe probably about five at the time. And it, uh, he just mentioned it in passing one night out of, at a moment of boredom, but that was the seed of the idea for me. And the beautiful thing is I've had this big comic and a movie out of it and I haven't paid him a penny. It's brilliant. <laughs> I've always been interested in secret society, and there's a romantic notion of a secret society too, you know, just, it's a, it's a great thing in literature, but we also know they do exist. And I, I like the idea of a, a super cabal of bad guys, you know, who are running the show, and the fraternity was our version of that. For me, it was probably a combination of two things that were my two big influences. One was The Godfather, because I, I liked the idea of the Al Pacino character, someone who goes from being the innocent to the monster over the course of one movie. Godfather was the greatest crime movie ever made, really, and I just wanted to do a super crime movie. The idea of a young man sort of learning uh, how to kill people, you know, is like a, is an ancient old story, you know, and, and we've just given it a sci-fi pop twist. The other thing I suppose that's maybe more obvious is Spider-Man, because he really was a 21st century interpretation of Peter Parker, that kind of geeky everyman that Peter Parker was. Wesley, in a lot of ways, is a dark reflection of that. Spider-Man's all about, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, this was the opposite, it's with great power comes you can do anything you like and no one can stop you. So it really is, it's the complete inverse of Spider-Man in that sense. We were really attracted to the idea of finding a guy who was an everyday guy who wasn't really happy with the decisions he made after college and where he was in the world and all of a sudden he was sucked into this world they didn't know existed. What Mark Millar did so well in the comic book was define a tone and it was hardcore and you hadn't seen that before in a while and we didn't want to lose that tone and in fact we told the studio and same with Timor that it's got to be an R-rated movie, it's got to be as hard as that comic book because it's that's what the fans expect.
for me wanted was about unfairness and injustice and the bad guys being in charge and uh, I probably couldn't have written it back in the 90s when things didn't really seem that bad you know you had the Berlin Wall coming down you had Clinton in the White House and things were looking pretty sweet for about 10 years you know and then suddenly the bad guys were just in charge and wanted almost subconsciously maybe was a response to that. I think Brits in particular are slightly more suspicious of authority than Americans. We are a little more suspicious of government and people in uniforms whereas Americans you know they're superheroes they're most idyllic characters really you know the most idealized characters are people that you look up to or guys who wear uniforms and maybe that's what we bring to American culture really that makes us a little different from the American writers like I don't think Wanted would have been done by an American comic writer I think it's a very European idea it's interesting it's new and it's very human and fantastic at the same time it's a lot of a lot of humor dark sarcastic but very human and entertaining and visually it was very interesting. There was a lot of compositions of the panels we used in the, in the movie. Flying, splashes of blood, a lot of moments. It has this graphic novel style. It was very provocative. There's a comic book and the characters and the, how, and the, the visual style is very provocative for filmmaker because it helps you to create something interesting. So, uh, so JG, I mean, I feel 90% of what people liked about it is JG's art, you know, the, it was just phenomenal looking. Um, and it, it looked like a movie already, you know, you could almost just see these as storyboards, you know, for a movie, because he's got such a cinematic style. So, uh, no, I couldn't be happier, you know, I couldn't have imagined anyone else drawing it. And that was one of the big reasons that it was sold quickly as a movie too. Um, and JG was a huge part of that, just having an A-list artist attached to your book, it's kind of like having an A-list actor or actress attached to your movie. Um, it just brought an enormous amount of attention to it. It's very unique. I like this very unique combination between ordinary life and fantasy world. When it's melded together. And when we started to work on the script, we understood that there's, we're missing something. There's something difficult to, to find. And, and we found it that it's exactly, it was, it was a Mark Millar dialogue, how people talk to each other. It's, it was very unique Mark Millar details. Even now, the, in, in, during the editing process, we, we're doing the same thing. When we have a problem, we don't know what to do. We had just everybody saying, okay, where's the comic book? We have to, we have to check how it was in comic book. And even if you are doing something different, but it's, good, it's, it's very important to step back, to clean the table, to, to, to see the original thing, and then to do the next step. It's because it's, this comic book has a unique tone and has a believable characters, dialogues, and, and the comic book was a big surprise for me because it was exactly the right tone for the movie. <laughs> evil genius and he's nuts and his work is incredibly cool and strange and he's got very odd angles on everything and even very big emotional sincere things he undercuts it with a very strange angle which I respond to very well I think that's great this uh, ah, stuff, then pull back inside the gate and they're firing a oh, little, bit, little bit back he wants me to reverse that Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very exciting. He's studied art for six years and he's a very deep thinking, focused guy. So it's cool to, to see him in, in the middle of a big Hollywood movie because he's bringing to it something that's unusual. Good! <laughs> it took me two weeks to be able to say Timur Bekmambetov. And then I stopped calling him Timur at all and I call him Becky. Day number 32. Welcome to the 62. His approach to filmmaking is completely out of the ordinary. The stuff that he's doing, you haven't seen before. You'll see afterwards, but you haven't seen it before. I remember the first time that I saw Timor's film Nightwatch and the cinematic experience of it and the visual language employed by Timor in that film was so unique and eye-popping and extraordinary. I thought, well, that's a voice that needs to be heard everywhere. And I thought, well, that's an absolute perfect fit 
to what we're trying to accomplish and want it. If we can start from there and follow him till the, till the elevator. I just think that I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm, do, I don't, I'm not thinking about why I'm different. Everybody's different and just I have to make something interesting for myself and for audience I imagine and it will be different and uh, for me to make this movie means to communicate with a new audience and to be interesting storyteller for them. You can stay, stay here. Mm -hmm. Amazing! There's some of the stuff he's doing. It's such a creative place. What's going on when you film it? It's like he allows you to come with ideas, and he comes with ideas, and he. And he dialogues, you know, the funny part was for me was his English wasn't like as clear so I could understand everything. So we would just communicate and I started just understanding him at a certain point. But he is a really talented director and I'm really grateful to be here. Like seeing his process too and seeing that he's letting us, you know, just go for hours and create at that place. So he want everything to be good. Let's move them over, over there from the beginning. Looking in that direction. You gotta have passion for what you do, and I feel his passion coming through for the movie, for, and for movie making. So it's great to work with him. Just we connect, even with the language barriers. What makes him different in one way, and he would tell you this, is that he, he likes to go into something, look at not just what you see, but then come closer to it, further into it, and, and then further, and then further and further into the DNA of something, whether it's a bullet or a gun or a car. He likes to go below the surface. He approaches everything from a very darkened and uh, ironic angle. Um, he really does think differently to most filmmakers. Uh, sometimes I'm quite shocked at what he asks me to do but generally it is for the good, I think, and, 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 and actually elevates the material. See this? See that particular piece there? It's rat feces. No, I don't have any more rat feces on me. Oh yeah, that's rat feces. That's what happens when rats eat food and they digest it, and what they don't use is left behind. It comes out of their behind, it comes out of their anus and it ends up in actors' hands. What makes Timur a little different, you know, growing up in, in, a, in a different part of the world, uh, having different experiences, you know, uh, looking at what we are looking at uh, in a different way, uh, seeing different things, you know, if you live in the city uh, and you grew up there, you, you look at the city different as somebody who just walks in. I think Timur was uh, a stroke of genius getting him involved. If it had been a more mainstream director, you know, possibly even an American director, it wouldn't have carried over that same attitude, you know. Timur comes from a place that's even colder than Scotland. It comes from, from uh, Kazakhstan. British writers generally do stuff that's a little bit more hard-edged than the American comic book writers. And I think the Russians, maybe because they're in a slightly colder and more bitter place than even here, have got an edge that even we don't have. So he just brought his own punky kind of attitude to it that uh, I wasn't expecting at all. And if anything, I think he even amped up the violence. It's even nastier than the book in a lot of places. Three, two, one, go! And Timur seemed gleeful about it. He seems to revel in this kind of thing. So he and I, we got on very well. The minute we met, we, we instantly liked each other. He had no idea what I was saying, probably, and I had no idea really what he was saying, but for some, we, we, we seem to kind of smile at each other a lot and slap each other on the back. I'm trying to do what I like, and of course, surrounded by new people, new like the crew and actors and producers. It's people from another world. And I'm trying to listen to understand how people react. It's just like in theater. You're on a stage and, and there's a huge audience and it's all the vibrations that helps you to move forward. 
One of the great things that Timor brings to all of his work is a very strong comedic sense. 42J, take five. Not in a silly broad way, but in a dark comedic way that constantly undercuts the earnestness of the film. And so while you're seeing very, very severe and sometimes uh, bloody sequences, there is something that appropriately, in a very character-driven way, is, is darkly comedic. And it's that constant undercutting and irony that Timor brings to it, both in the script and visually, that I think gives Wanted a very unique tone and transcends the genre as we know it and makes it something that audiences will enjoy and be marvelously entertained, but also something they haven't seen before and experience a thrill and a great ride and great characters and great acting, all within the very sure and deft hand of a truly visionary filmmaker. I think your life is dark, but humor is humor. Just the, 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 it's humor in dark context, the, the, the dark environment, but the humor is, the humor is the only way to, to, uh, to survive. And during this very tough movie with a lot of violence and action and scary stuff, the humor helps audience, characters and audience to, to survive. I love audience. I want to give them something exciting for two hours because the life is not so easy and happy. And for two hours they have to enjoy something very rich and enthusiastic and energetic and funny. Take care about this. Oh. Too bad Dato's not here. <laughs> so this is? This is a clear bra strap from a lady's brasier that's underwear. Sexy. Guns are bad and they don't make your teeth white. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> we had a large uh, portion of filming this chase sequence on a street called Lower Wacker. I don't know why it was called Wacker. I don't really want to speculate too much because it'll get sorted. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, oh you can't. No, <laughs> I was born in Brooklyn. And then, you know, Ewan McGregor and, and, and Dougray Scott and, and Gerard Butler and all these big Scottish guys started. Yeah, chicks, they, them, they started doing really well in Hollywood, and I thought, you know, you're going to get me a Scottish accent. I really want to go with the Cubs game. They went, well, you know, James, we own the uh, we own the Cubs, so we'll hook you up with some tickets. And they were like, great. I was like, great. They said, just call us, and we'll, hit, we'll get you thrown out the first ball, and we'll get you 10 tickets and stuff. I was like, excellent. So I eventually convinced myself to call them, and uh, they're like, oh, well, you know, James, I'm sorry, but it's the biggest game of the season, and all the tickets are gone, so we're sorry. So now I know that I'm cheap enough to call up and ask for the free tickets merely because I'm in movies. And uh, and it still doesn't work. Last year I had to play someone who was actually Scottish as well. Really? For the first time and uh, and that was cool because everyone was coming up but wow, you're you know you're you're usually playing all these American people and these English people, you know, it's great to hear you with your own accent and, and I just thought, you know, that's that's testament to the acting that I do, not in films but in real life in real situations, because I'm constantly acting. My best work is right now.
Or if you gotta go and feel like in the dark room, or if some asshole has cut your eyes out of your face. Just try to cut me. What? Why? What? You pussy. What? You pussy or pussy cat? If you lunch at me, <coughs> I Marie Corrigan, uh -huh. I'll tell you a thing. Oh. Kasumi, your boss, your boss. Take anything you want. Special effects is done in real time. That can be something as simple as rain, as wind, as smoke. And it can also be as complicated as hydraulics, as pneumatics, electronics. What you see on the screen in real time with the artist is what we do. It could be the explosion of the fraternity. be the rollover of a car. And the train sequence, we're heavily involved. <laughs> Once you get a script like this, it, within the first couple of pages, you realise it's a special effects film. And for all special effects guys, we want to do physical, practical effects. And action. And I think you get more scope by doing it practically. It's there, it's on film, it's on camera, and you've got it. Even if it may be something quite simple, but it's all part of, of making all the cogs work within the making of a film. Timor possesses a unique gift in his ability to visually create worlds in a manner that we haven't seen before, and developed his own process of special effects and redefining how effects are used in the filmmaking process, basically blurring the distinction between production and post-production since his effects are done in the course of production, and is able to create in a very real, grounded way effects and worlds that you haven't seen before. Hey, I, I think that's my old train. Still is. Within the sequence of the L train in Chicago, we need to show Wes and Fox in part of their training. Um, part of the training is, is that uh, Fox is super cool. She knows exactly what's going to happen. But Wes is learning his train. So the idea is to give obstacles that Fox goes under, which is a bridge that we drive up to within the L train. And she very coolly kind of lays back, she just goes underneath it. There was a problem because the train is too big to move. And we decided that we will move, not train, we'll move the bridge. Obviously, the trains can't move. So they've shot plate shots out in Chicago. And we're shooting that within a green world. What we need to do is we need to do two elements. One, we need to give movement to the top of the train. And secondly, we need to give the impression that the train is moving. So we design a set piece that actually travels over the top of the train to give the impression that the train is moving, but in fact, it's stationary. We have a train sequence in this film where it comes off the tracks whilst on a bridge on a huge gorge, like a thousand, two thousand foot gorge. We had a huge gimbling machine to revolve the huge train carriage and we built it in Prague. It was maybe a hundred feet. It was a huge machine, big. <laughs> and the train starts to fall. So the next thing that I've got to do today, actually, is be inside that train while it's turning 360 degrees. And it's going to spin it, spin it, spin it, and make it do that. And I'm going to be inside it and try and get from one end of it to the other with 20 people inside falling around. This is probably the largest set piece that we've rotated and tilted at the same time. Normally, you only need to rotate or you need to tilt a set. It's very unusual that you should want to do both. We do as many tests as we possibly can. 
what we've done today is we, we've shown that we can rotate this, this rig and we've got control of it, um, which is very important because what we don't want to do is we don't want to get the rig to be out of control of us. I'm really enjoying it. When will I get to run through a train carriage that's spinning 360 degrees and have a wire on me so that I can take all the risks that I want to take without falling out and crashing my head, you know? So it's fantastic, it's great fun. Oh God, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I, I, I feel kind of good. Timor has this great idea that these wax baths rejuvenate you. So you spend the day being a fraternity member and then of an evening time you have a soak in those wax baths and it reheals you. This bath stimulates my blood cells and speed up the process. In here bruises, cuts, breaks, killing hours, not days. You shitting me? The ironic thing about special effects is that something like that could be more difficult than in fact the explosions that we did on the shop floor. <laughs> Timor was quite specific about what he wanted. He didn't want the Hollywood flame explosion. He wanted very much the dust and debris that you get from an old building that's been sitting around for 100 years and then suddenly an explosion goes off. It's very difficult to blow up sets. Unfortunately, most sets have to be built and constructed to be strong, to be practical. Part of our job is to take away the strength of the set, but still allow it to stand up at the end of the day, and also trying to make it look visual. <laughs> Within several of those locations, one of them were involved with stuntmen at the same time. Go! And we had dropping debris, we had exploding looms, exploding rats. It was busy. And like all things, we're shooting them at 150 frames, which is roughly, you'll see it back six times slower than you would in normal. So what's really important is that the sequence is very quick. So that means that lots of explosions have to go off simultaneously. If we take too long to do it, our physical time on the screen, we we'll only see one explosion whereas we want to see 20 explosions. Part of the car chase sequence is a sequence where the Viper drives towards a police brocade and does a handbrake turn and manages to flip and roll over the police brocade. That's been shot out in Chicago. But what we're doing in Prague here is we've got the Viper car and we've built a rig for it to roll over with the artist in that's going to be shot against green screen. I feel is going to be one of those moments within the film that's going to be really memorable because what's great is that we have our two main actors involved and we have the police officer and we'll be able to see all three of them all in the same time interacting with one another as the real full-size car rolls over a police car and over the actor. The more that you can do in real time, the better for everybody. <laughs> My thoughts on Wanted, I think it's going to be very interesting. Visually, it's going to be unique. there's going to be some great sequences <laughs> that haven't been done before. I think Timor's dream is that we get a chance to do sequences and, and things that haven't been done before and, um, and manipulate them so that they come across really well. <laughs>
This is the office where I work as an assistant to the associate editor on Hypothyroidism Today, the third biggest autoimmune periodical on the eastern seaboard. This is me taking shit from my African-American boss. As you can see, I'm smiling as she insults me, but it's only because I'm embarrassed by the situation and more than a little afraid of the scary fucking bitch. This is the sesame-crusted salmon over sourdough with mustard greens and wasabi mayonnaise I like to have for lunch, just to prove I'm different from the herd. Most weekdays, these semi-literate cholo fucks meet me off the bus and walk behind me, hurling insults about my baggies or my old-school pumas. Most weeknights, I tell my girlfriend I'm finishing up some work, but spend a couple of hours browsing the net for new stress-related diseases I think I might have. I'm not a bad person or anything, I'm just an ordinary guy in a bad situation. Doesn't everyone hate neighbors who exhibit a relentlessly cheery disposition? Cheer up, Wesley. It might never happen, kiddo. My name is Wesley Gibson, and my dad walked out on my mom when I was 18 weeks old. Did he look into my baby blues and realize that he'd just fathered one of the most insignificant assholes of the 21st century? against here? Didn't they tell you what I'm capable of? I'm the scariest super fuck who ever walked the earth, assholes! Didn't they explain that you'd be sent to kill the killer? Oh, Jesus. I think I'm going into shock. Listen. Listen to me, son. If I wanted you dead, that bullet would have gone through your hypothalamus. But I wanted you alive, so I could show you something. Paying attention, little soldier. This wasn't our idea, man. I swear. I don't even know who you are. You were just a name in an envelope. Oh, really? And here I thought you boys were criminal fucking masterminds. Who sent you, dickwad? Who the fuck are you people? Just the decoys, man. Just the motherfucking decoys. What? Uh, could I have a sesame-crusted salmon over sourdough with mustard greens and wasabi mayonnaise, please, Jared? Two seconds, man. Two seconds. Actually, you should cancel that order, Jared. Because my friend here ain't gonna have time to masticate over his sourdough this afternoon. Excuse me? Didn't you hear? You got the rest of the day off, Wesley. Me and you got an appointment this afternoon. And the professor don't like to be kept standing around. Get your hands off me! How the hell do you know my name? Wow. How uncharacteristically assertive, Wesley. You feeling brave with all these people around? You think the fox is scared of a goddamn security camera? Jesus Christ! Now get in the fucking car while I still got this little Miss Patience smile on my face, asshole. You and me got a motherfucking business appointment. I can't believe you just did that. The cops are gonna be all over you for this. You're gonna go to jail. Jesus, Wesley. Would you lighten up? I know you've been scared your entire life, but I've been sent here to tell you that those days are behind you, man. As long as one of us is wearing this pin or driving a car with these number plates, we can do whatever we want. You can shoot, kill, rape, or destroy anyone you like now, baby. Consequences are for the little people when you got a seat in the fraternity. Oh god. This is a nightmare. This is a fucking nightmare I'm having. Only difference between a dream and a nightmare is how big your balls are, bitch. Superheroes are no longer a concern, I'm happy to report. Oh, Jesus. I think I'm gonna throw up. 
What are you saying, boy, that you've never seen an old man cobbling time-traveling footwear? The name's Professor Solomon Seltzer, by the way, and it's my very great pleasure to meet you at last. I take it the Fox Ears explained why we coerced you into this exciting little meeting? Uh, not really. She said it had something to do with my dad, but we never really got a chance to talk about it. Oh, it's got everything to do with your late father, Wesley. He and I were tremendous friends, you know. Did you know he was my personal bodyguard? Actually, Dad upped and left when I was only a baby. All I ever saw were pictures of him. And my mom told me he was an airline pilot. To be fair, she was probably as much in the dark about his true profession as you were, Wesley. We take an oath when we join the fraternity, so she won't have known a thing about the homes, the cars, or the $50 million in cash you're about to inherit. Excuse me? The killer's estate, my boy. It seems he was so racked with guilt about walking out on you all those years ago that he's left you every single penny that he ever earned. You mean I'm a multimillionaire, just like that? No, I'm afraid it's not that simple, Wesley. Your father left some very specific conditions with this inheritance, and I can't part with a cent unless you agree to comply. What kind of conditions? Well, it seems he wants us to compensate for all the effeminate affectations you've picked up over the years from your neurotic single mother. He wants us to employ you for six months, lick you into shape, and essentially teach you how to be a man, my boy. His dying wish was that, at the end of our time together, you'll be in rather more control of your life. Either that, of course, or you could go back to being bitched at by your African-American boss. This is ridiculous. How could I be a supervillain? I've never even been in a fight, for God's sake. But you're a natural, Wesley. Your talent for death is written all over your DNA. That's why I want you as my own personal bodyguard. But I've never even fired a gun. It doesn't matter. It's in the blood, and you're going to prove it to yourself now by taking down these six flies who have been distracting me all morning. Are you out of your mind? Almost certainly. But that's neither here nor there, young man. Fox, could you persuade Mr. Gibson to do as he's told, please? My pleasure, Professor. What? Shoot the wings off the fucking flies, Wesley. Are you nuts? I'm not shooting any flies! On the count of three. What? One. Jesus Christ! Two. Fox, for God's sake. Three. There. That wasn't so difficult, now was it? Isn't it obvious? The answer to all your problems, Wesley. So, what's the verdict, boy? The professor gave you 24 hours to think about our offer, and you're already skating on hour 23. What's it gonna be? I really want to do it, Fox. I want you to teach me how to say fuck you to people just like everybody else does. What do you mean, Wesley? You've got to be a little more specific here. I want to be a supervillain, Fox. I want you to teach me how to be a bad guy. You do, huh? Well, first lesson begins right now, little man. I want you to stand up, throw your papers in the air, and give a big almighty fuck you to all those asshole number crunches around you. You're kidding, right? It's up to you, Mr. Gibson. A place in your daddy's super criminal fraternity, or a lifetime sucking the cock of that fat lesbian boss you like so much. What's it gonna be? Oh, Jesus Christ. I can't believe I'm actually doing this. Fuck you! Fucking I must be out of my mind. I must be out of my goddamn mind here. What you talking about, bitch? They the ones eating shit 50 hours a week to pay their goddamn credit card bills. You about to make more in a day than they do in their motherfucking lifetimes. Now before any 
anyone complains. I just want to stress that these innocent people were dead and buried long before I started pumping hot lead into their lifeless cadavers. The fox just thought I should get used to the sight of flesh splintering and bone flying before she moved me on to any live human targets. That's the way, baby. Don't think of these people as lovable grandmas and grandpas no more. Just think of this as house of motherfucking dead or something. I spend the mornings working out, and the afternoons getting worked over by the biggest bastard I've ever laid eyes on. Like me, you might be wondering what kind of training involves being tied to a chair and having your face rearranged, but it's all part of the plan, the fox assures me. How else you gonna lose this faggoty fear of getting punched in the face, huh? After three weeks, I've lost four teeth, fractured my jaw, broken three ribs, and personally killed 12,817 farm animals. Week five, they finally take the handcuffs off. Good morning, Wesley. You ready for your daily shit kicking, short ass? Fuck you, dick cheese! Oh. Well, you definitely got your old man's knack for improvisation, Wesley. How you feeling over there? Sick, nauseous, wrecked with guilt over your first human kill. How do I feel? Like I just fucked Marilyn Monroe without a condom. It's true what they say. After the first, it just gets easier and easier. In fact, it's a lot like eating Pringles in the sense that you're not even sure you can stop sometimes. You've joined a secret fraternity of super criminals? That's right, Lisa. My dad was a comic book supervillain, and when he got bumped off, I automatically got his place in this secret organization nobody knows about. Oh, Jesus, Wesley. Oh, Jesus, 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 H. Christ! Have you any idea how fucking low this is? What? I know, you've got major confrontation issues, but this is too much. Could you please just admit that you've met someone else and act like a man for a change? But I haven't met somebody else. Okay, I'm getting sex lessons from a jewel thief who's teaching me how to fuck properly, but I'm not actually seeing anybody. Uh, you're having sex with somebody else? You're actually admitting this? Oh, please. Spare me the indignation, Lisa. Like you haven't been fucking my best friend for the last year and a half? What? It's okay. You don't have to lie anymore. I shot him in the face and dropped his body in a dumpster last night anyway. Christ, Wesley! Can't you see how delusional you're becoming? Can't you see you're in the middle of a nervous breakdown here? No, I'm not. I'm having the opposite of a breakdown. I'm having a goddamn kickstart, Lisa. And I've never felt better in my life. You're really gonna throw it all away? Just like that? Throw what away? We never really had anything. We just sat home watching television every night and fucked like old people once a month. Wesley, you walk out that door and I swear to God, I, I, I'm gonna slit my wrists, you selfish bastard! I'm not kidding around here, I absolutely mean it! Fuck you, Lisa. What? You heard me, fuck you. I'm sorry, but it's really that simple. When Universal comes to Grimm and proposes to make a sequel of Want of the Movie as a game, we get really enthusiastic here at Green Barcelona. We bring up a really talented team at one sees. We wanted the team to work as close as possible with the movie production to be sure that we get the feeling of Timur's creative visions. We actually met with Universal uh, and looked over the script before anything had been started to be filmed or anything like that. When we started shooting in, in Prague, um, we were actually on set watching the, the actors um, go at it, and that gave us a true, true inspiration to make this game action-filled and full of backstory as well. 
When we first approached Grin, we saw some of the next-gen games they're working on right now, and we were pretty much blown away by them, so it was kind of like perfect fit. Universal, Grin, Wanted. Some of the benefits uh, with making a game based off the movie is that the world is pretty much built for you. So you have the storyline, you have the characters, you have assets, and you're working with all these professional people, so it's like a big playground for the developer. Really, in terms of doing a film to a game, this was a no-brainer. I mean, if you look at the big action sequences that happen and the way that we could sort of translate those directly to a game, it made it a, an experience that every gamer would want to have. Timor has created such an amazing world, and uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do was get the player into that world so that they could experience it just like the viewer sees it in the film, but actually be able to play and manipulate things. <laughs> In the movie, you can see Wesley trying to retrieve information from his past, know who he is, know where is his father, what happened to him. In the video game, we try to do something similar. So basically, Wesley will search information about his mother. There's a message in, uh, in our script. The message is that the obedience, the blind obedience to rules, you know, can lead to disastrous situations. two main characters. You play with Cross, you play with Wesley. So that allows us to create some interest in situations in which you're playing in the past with your father, and that explains some of the blanks that uh, the movie story has. And also uh, create some compelling situations, gameplay situations, in which you, for instance, there's one level in which you're defending Wesley Baby when he's just a child uh, playing as Cross, which is a, a very emotional situation. You're defending yourself in the past. So we try to mimic that evolution that Wesley has in the movie. You start the game like just uh, as a standard 3D action game, shooting at enemies, getting into cover, trying to kill them, aiming and shooting. But then you get those special, unique abilities from the movie, like curving bullets, you know, slowing down time so you can really see where are they kill them really easily. Acting for five minutes like Janice doesn't make all our lives miserable is the hardest work I'll do all day. Another thing that we thought that will be really useful for us for the gameplay experience was that Wesley in the movie breaks the fourth wall and directly talks without respect to the audience. Who's the man? We just try to mimic that on our game and just give him that kind of fuck you attitude. I'm the man. The killer suit represents the final step on the evolution of Wesley into the biggest assassin ever, the killer. We created it especially for the fans of the franchise and it looks really cool. So we really wanted to offer to the players a collection, a band of really colorful enemies, enemies you are going to love to hate. Most of them are based on shooting and taking cover and shoot from a distance, but some others uh, break that rule and makes you play in a different way. Uh, fast assassins are, are melee combatants that approach to you and stab you. But also we have elite enemies which are tougher, they have bigger guns, and they deal much more damage. So these enemies are a real pain in the ass. For this project, we've had quite a few motion capture shoots where we got our team of animators to um, take the action and using traditional techniques, exaggerate the movement. So taking the anticipation and exaggerating it and putting more aggression into the actual the hit within the close combat and we're, we're very pleased with the result. There's a shot in the film where, where the train carriage is falling down and uh, the character Wesley is uh, climbing up the, the carriage. So within the game we were, we were hoping to emulate that but we're going to be using a plane instead of a train carriage and that presented quite a few technical challenges in the motion capture. One of the big uh, locations in the movie is the Chicago Fraternity. 
so we obviously were very interested in trying to put some of those locations into the game. The shop floor is uh, one of the big action sequences. You actually get a chance to also go through that in the game. Um, after Wesley has gone through it in the movie, so you're going through the destroyed version, which is uh, very interesting. The library really stuck out to us as a very interesting location, so uh, viewers of the movie and players of the game could make the connection between the two. Uh, so we have really tried hard to go in and get all the detail from the movie to model it down to the exact detail. The Luma Fade Room in the movie is actually a forbidden place. Nobody except the leader of the fraternity is allowed to go in there. But in the game, the player is allowed. So you actually get to go really close to the Luma Fade and uh, see the room uh, with your own eyes. A gameplay sequence breaks down into several parts. Um, the first uh, thing you have to do is assess the, the situation and try to figure out what a position you have. Like the amount of enemies, what weapons they have, what cover they have, is there any way around them or you know above them. The second part is to, of course, get into the actual combat. Uh, features you can use there is, of course, the, the uh, blind fire feature, which enables you to control your enemies a bit. Uh, key to this game is to, to move around uh, and you know, try to get good angles. You shouldn't be exposing yourself to too many enemies at the same time, because that's going to be very, very, very dangerous. So it's more like a, a chess game, or you know, there's some, some tactics in there. You don't just move up to cover and sit and shoot. You have to actually you know, work with your uh, environment. Uh, work with your enemy, uh, work with the uh, weapons you have, uh, and also work with your own skill set. One of the unique things that you can see in the movie is the ability of Wesley to perform curved bullets. So he can shoot any enemy around, even if he's hiding behind an object or a wall. Uh, opens up the game a lot. Uh, we tried to do this to, to increase the, the uh, depth, basically, of the game, and not only have a cover mechanic and then some shooting. This is really fun. You know, you see a, an enemy hiding be behind a cover, trying to avoid your bullets, and then you just, bam, curve a bullet and game over for him. Bullet explosions allow players to curve two bullets at a time. So when they collide, they just create a shower of splinters and kill some enemies around. Timur, the director from the movie, was really excited when he saw this for the first time. When you kill enemies in the game, you get adrenaline. With it, you can slow down time, jump out of a cover, and in the middle of the air, start shooting at their heads without mercy. Shit! <laughs> 
kill him.